Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the last prime time event of the year. Thanks for joining us. If you missed any of the presentations, you can view them in the Bethel Community Video Collection in the Bethel University Digital Library. Primetime brings you programming that celebrates learning in and beyond the classroom of Bethel faculty, students, and staff, and is a collaboration between the Friends of the Bethel University Library, Academic Affairs, and other offices on campus. We're so glad you've joined us. Today, Dr. Edie Shapolsky and Dr. Amy Dykstra will share how they collaborated to bring students in a social work class together with students in an ecology class to engage with an urban community to develop the understanding and skills required to bring about environmental justice. Let's welcome Edie and Amy. Well, hi everybody. Thank you so much for coming. We thought maybe nobody would come since it's so warm out and it's the last getting so close to the end of the year. So um, Amy and I are really happy to be here today to talk about our interdisciplinary collaboration. I don't know if any of you saw the signs that were up that had half me and half Amy on it like around. So the most important product of this work is really this picture that shows the true interdisciplinary nature of our collaboration when we came together. I could not stop laughing at this, so we had to show it. So, so um, I'm just going to introduce this project starting from a social work perspective. In social work, we have nine competencies, and those are general competencies that our accrediting agency requires that all undergraduate programs, bachelors of social work, operate under. We do our assessment based on that. And our competency three is um, about advancing uh, human rights, social, economic, and environmental justice. And I just want to share that with you. Social workers understand that every person, regardless of position in society, has fundamental human rights, such as freedom, safety, privacy, and an adequate standard of living, health care, and education. Social workers understand the global interconnections of oppression and human rights violations and are knowledgeable about theories of human need and social justice and strategies to promote social and economic justice and human rights. Social workers understand strategies designed to eliminate oppressive structural barriers to ensure that social goods, rights, and responsibilities are distributed equitably and that civil, political, environmental, economic, social, and cultural human rights are protected. It's very easy for us to look over that environmental piece. Part of the behaviors that our students and social workers are assessed on are the following. Advocate for human rights at the individual and system levels, that's something we should do, and then engage in practices that advance human rights to promote social, racial, economic, and environmental justice. There's really been, uh, well, honestly, an ongoing philosophical shift in sort of those constructs of social work practice over the years. And um, recently, um, there has been changes in our EPOS, our Educational Policy and Accreditation Standards, to focus more specifically on this, and the critical examination of practices that perpetuate utilitarian views of human beings, the society, the economy, economy and more specifically for this particular presentation, the environment. We all know and are aware of the fact that exploitation occurs across interconnected systems. We talk a lot in social work about ecosystems perspective and theory and systems theory. Um, we also know that uh, that exploitation does threaten the health and well-being of humankind and contributes very significantly, particularly in underserved, historically underserved communities to health disparities. We also know that it threatens the delicate balance of ecosystems which um, support and sustain all living things. In our, in our um, social work curriculum, we try to place concepts related to human liberation, emancipation, human rights, social, economic, and environmental justice at the center of our work. We train our students to develop the skills required to advance environmental justice, which really requires that we move outside the context of our classroom. And really, I think, we really only are able to pay lip service to that because we, we want it, we know it, environmental justice is important, but how do we really train social workers to do it? 
Um, the inclusion of this kind of work, exploration of community gardens, which we'll talk about in a few minutes in service learning context, is increasingly used across the country as strategies to help understand better how to address disparities in food insecurities in urban contexts. So exploring pedagogical strategies that interweave tenets of ecological science and social work in real life urban settings really is a viable consideration in the advancements of methods that we want to uh, train our students in to address health disparities and advance justice in historically underserved communication. So for me, my motivation in approaching Amy and engaging in this work is really to consider ways that we can in our department, across our programs, in our curricula, to um, include concepts of environment and really an operationalized way to engage students in that work. We are also now mandated more specifically through our new EPAS. I mentioned that a minute ago. Um, a couple years ago, I served on the National Task Force to develop a curriculum guide on environmental justice. Um, and we recognize social workers don't have the knowledge, the skills, or the training. Um, so we want to move beyond that lip service to seek practical and effective strategies to counter those destructive practices, which we know impact the health and well being of individuals, communities and families. So really, I was seeking this interdisciplinary collaboration as a strategy to bridge the divide between the intention that we have to improve justice, environmental justice in communities, and the meaningful practice. So moving on to thinking about ecology education, undergraduate ecology education has traditionally consisted of lecture-based instruction in core concepts of ecology, and then we've used laboratory and field work to learn ecology practices, skills necessary for an ecologist to learn. And more recently, there's been an increased emphasis on human-environment interactions, and actually, when I wrote my first faith integration paper, I focused on how humans have always managed the environment, and there's no such thing as an environment that's not managed by humans. Um, and we've also tried to emphasize sustainability, um, but there has still not been very much emphasis on environmental justice. Um, and it's just kind of hard for ecologists to focus on justice issues. It just seems not very scientific. Um, However, the Ecological Society of America has come up with a framework for teaching ecology education. It's known as the Four-Dimensional Ecology Education Framework. It was released in 2013, at, and it includes four dimensions, as you can see in this graphic. The um, ecology concepts, as I mentioned, ecology practices, which we've traditionally gotten through laboratories and field work, learning the skills of ecologists. And it does include human environment interactions as an important uh, dimension. And then there are cross-cutting cross themes. And amongst these four dimensions of ecology, there are 21 different concepts that are covered. And I will focus on the concepts that are listed under the human environment interactions dimension. And there are four concepts in this dimension, including human dependence on the environment, human effects on the environment that, cause, that accelerate environmental change, talking about how humans shape and manage resources, and then finally ethics, which involves critical thinking about values underlying environmental problems, challenges, and opportunities. So I'll drill in a little bit more on number three and four here. Number three includes several different kinds of environments, including agricultural ecosystems, e ecological engineering, natural resource management, conservation biology, and um, urban ecosystems. And so there's more of an emphasis now in ecology classes on the urban environment, um, urban ecology. And then number four, includes not only environmental ethics and sustainability and ecological economics, but environmental justice. And so here's a graphic from the USDA 
that um, focus on, focuses on environmental justice. So for me, my motivations for engaging in this collaboration were number one, I really wanted to better implement, implement the four-dimensional ecology education framework in my classes. And I was interested in developing some kind of a relationship with the Bethel Frogtown Sun University um, community partnership. And I didn't know how to do either one of those things. And I had a couple of important nudges. The first one was that Tandon Brecky who was very involved in this partnership, um, just approached me because he knew that I taught courses in the environmental area and he encouraged me to think about developing some kind of a project. And then Edie approached me about collaborating with her class, her social work class. And so we decided that um, Edie's social work class, and I can't remember which class it was, the community practice class, and then my, I was teaching plant taxonomy and ecology. And so we decided to collaborate and try to bring an uh, environmental justice unit to our students um, as a collaboration with the Frogtown Summit University Community Partnership. So this collaboration with Amy's students and Amy really did provide our students with an opportunity to learn and explore in that in partnership, which we found was very powerful. Um, and there were multiple activities and projects to design and increase students' understanding of these issues. So we're going to share a little bit about what that looked like for our students. But before we do that, we want to just share some of the information that we provided to the students about environmental justice and environmental racism to kind of have a foundation. Um, environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. This goal of environmental justice will be achieved when everyone enjoys, firstly, the same degree of protection from environmental and health hazards across all economic um, systems and equal access to the decision-making process to have a healthy environment in which to live, learn, and work. So there were a couple of other um, quotes here that we thought were really powerful. The, empower, the environment from this perspective is not the people-free biophysical system idealized by deep ecologists, but rather a geographical system integrally linking to people and society through everyday, ordinary activities and relationships, residents, labor, and recreation. It encompasses the air people breathe walking down a city or country street, the water drawn from their taps or wells, the chemicals a worker is exposed to in an industrial plant or in a strawberry field, and the forest people visit to hike, extract mushrooms, and engage in spiritual practice. This conception of the environment links labor and public health, recreation to housing, culture, and history. It breaks the boundaries between work environments and open space, urban and rural. The environmental justice movement is, by definition, an exciting example of multi-ethnic coalitions working for change in diverse, linked arenas of struggle. And this is evident in the environmental justice literature. I think it's, I think it's me now. <laughs> so uh, the environmental justice movement really started by individuals, primarily by people of color who recognized that they were experiencing um, environmental injustice in their communities and the civil rights movement of the United of the 1960s was really important for sounding the alarm about um, public health dangers that some of these communities were facing and Robert Bullard the father of environmental justice he's known as the father of environmental justice said that whether by conscious design or institutional neglect Communities of color in urban ghettos or in rural poverty pockets or on economically impoverished Native American reservations face some of the worst environmental devastation in the nation. 
um, moving beyond environmental justice, we also gave our students a definition of environmental racism, which is a type of dis discrimination where people of low income or minority communities are forced to live in close proximity to environmentally hazardous or degraded environments, um, such as toxic waste, pollution, urban decay. And just for some statistics, an estimated 70% of contaminated waste sites are located in low-income neighborhoods. And the majority of Americans who live in um, sites that are vulnerable to flooding are in black and brown communities. We have some more. On the, um, in contrast, whites have secured relatively cleaner environments by moving away from older industrial cores of cities um, via suburbanization. That's a big word for ecologist. <laughs> um, and race is still a very potent factor for predicting where locally unwanted land uses, Lulu's, I like that, Lulu's, <laughs> go. Um, you could say that it's class, but we know that race and class are intertwined. And I think when we practiced, you actually did this slide. Yes. So stepping aside. Um, a few more uh, pieces of information that we think are, were helpful for our students. Hazardous sites are more often than not placed in communities with an already high concentration of people of color. So reiterating a little bit what Amy just said. Industry, industries and manufacturing require sites to dump the toxins they produce. And so whether they choose the land, air, or water as their waste bin, it is usually the air, land, or water belonging to communities of color. The Minnesota Pollution Control Agency found that 91% of Minnesotan communities of color and indigenous communities and 46% of low-income communities are above the air pollution-related risk guidelines compared to 31% statewide. So the Frogtown community is an example of where this environmental injustice occurs. So a little bit of background about Frogtown, and I think this is a quote from Alexius Hoffman from the 1800s, 1867, um, which we think shows a, the stark uh, contrast between what Frogtown town is like now. This swamp country was the place where the frogs lived and croaked. As you walked on the road on a summer's day, the frogs and froglets which had come out of the jungle to bask in the noonday sun would jump off in all directions as if they had pressing business elsewhere. So a stark contrast to what we see now in Frogtown. We know that Frogtown is among the most diverse neighborhoods in St. Paul. 71% uh, these are our current data. We just updated these this very morning. 71% um, uh, of people from the BIPOC community and here's the statistics on those. We see that 43% speak a language other than English, um, and that 25.6 live below the poverty line, and there's a high percentage of people that live just above the poverty line in the Frogtown community as well. And here's a map that shows um, the Frogtown community, and then you can see below that here in the Summit University, that was historically the Rondo um, community. And so if you don't know where that is, hopefully this map gives you a little bit of information on that. All right, so we want to talk a little bit about what we actually did in the project. We started out by having a joint meeting between our two classes. We managed to arrange that in our schedules to have a big meeting with all of us. And um, Tandon joined us for that, and we just presented the project to our students. Um, we actually started with a survey that we'll talk about in a minute. We gave our students an, just, an introduction to environmental justice and environmental racism. Um, and we talked about the, we, uh, Tandon gave some background on the Frogtown community's uh, historical perspective and kind of what the community is now. And we talked about what we were going to be doing in the project. And we divided the students into small groups that were interdisciplinary. So each small group had a couple of students who were from my plant taxonomy and ecology class and a couple of students that were from Edie's social work class. So we gave them some time to get to know each other and plan some of the activities for the semester. So we'll talk a little bit about the survey. So for the survey Amy and I developed, um, we did use some questions from the social dominance scale, which measures preferences for intergroup inequality. 
And then we also added a whole bevy of questions on our own, some related to climate change, and then also questions about the environment, access to safe and clean drinking water, recycling habits, access to healthy food, renewable energy, healthcare as a human right, protection of biodiversity, sharing of community resources, mining, we know that's a big issue in northern Minnesota, equality, equity, and whether or not they believe that their actions could impact the future. And then, during the semester, we took two field trips, and the first one that we did, and unfortunately our classes were separate in the field trips, but we both took the same field trips. The first one, it was called the Food Glorious Food Tour, and it's a walking tour of community gardens in the Frogtown and Summit University neighborhoods, and it was led by community workers, so it gave our students a chance to meet people from the community, and it gave them a chance to see some of the efforts that the community is already making to address health disparities um, and food insecurity. And as part of that walking tour, we walked across a couple of highway bridges over the I-94 freeway, which was um, constructed right, in, right through the historic Rondo neighborhood. And so the construction of that freeway in the 1960s has had really devastating effects on that community including the loss of over 700 homes and 300 businesses. And so our students got to learn a little bit about that by visiting a memorial to the Rondo neighborhood and um, as well as all of these community gardens. So we have a few pictures from this. I'll let Edie talk about these. So this is just um, our students. We went to a couple of the Peace Gardens. So a picture from that. Uh, uh, the students at the memorial um, where we had a community member that told the story of Rondo. And again, one of the things that's such a powerful learning for us and a, a, a position from which social worker approach, social work approaches our practice in general is that the importance of allowing community members to be the experts in what they need. And so for our students to go into the community here and to hear from the community was really powerful. Um, and a couple other shots of the students um, at different Peace Gardens when we, when we went there. Um, these pictures here, this is a shot of I-94, obviously, and we're cut through um, the Rondo neighborhood. And this is a picture, Amy will talk in a minute, I think, about the land bridges. But here's the proposed land bridge um, that they are talking about for um, the 94, and it's the Reconnect Rondo. So though you might have been, those might have been your slides too. Maybe. Yeah, I actually moved those and didn't tell you about okay. that. So <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so this is the proposed land bridge, and this proposal of building this land bridge over I-94 is an idea um, designed to bring some environmental justice to this community and reconnect that historical Rondo neighborhood. So our second field trip was to Minnehaha Park, where there is an existing land bridge over the Hiawatha Avenue or Highway 55 freeway. And so it gave our students um, just a way to experience a land bridge. And land bridges have been used at both as restorative installa installations and ways to contribute to reduction in noise pollution, also a way of just increasing green space in communities. And um, some people are familiar with land bridges that are used as wildlife corridors in more rural settings, but there are also lots of land bridges in urban settings. And I was just out in Denver a few weeks ago and my brother was telling me that they're thinking of doing a land bridge over as they're like rebuilding, I think it's I-70 through Denver. So that's going to be a huge project. So students were able to experience how quiet and peaceful it was on the land bridge compared to their experience of walking over a city um, street bridge over the I-94 freeway that was really noisy. And um, they were really able to notice the disparity with that historical Rondo neighborhood. So here's a couple of, of um, photos from that. The one on the left is Tandon kind of explaining to the students what they were going to see and there's a community 
um, partner there and some of my students. And then this shot here on the right is actually from on top of the land bridge. So you would never know that you were on a bridge. Um, there's actually big blue stand growing out there, one of my favorite plants. And then we didn't include, I mean, there you can look even at examples of land bridges in Duluth um, and around the country. If you look that up, you'll see. Uh, they're also called land caps. And it's interesting to note even data, which we didn't include in this, that show the disparate health and life expectancy outcomes with people that live within certain proximities of interstates. Um, so in addition to those two outings, the groups of the interdisciplinary groups of students participated in work days. So um, they would go, they would pick Tandon, provided a whole list of community generated options for students, students and they would go and help with gardening or help with different community activities related to the training of the community. Um, some of them even went to like the jazz festival because that was a thing that they wanted, uh, an event so students could engage. And this really did allow the students to learn about environmental justice issues directly from community constituents. And I talked about the importance of that a minute ago. And again, here's a couple pictures. Probably many of you know Melvin Giles at the bottom, who um, is very engaged in this work. Um, and so you can see again, students, this, is the, this isn't the work day, but this is our social work students touring in the Food Glorious Food um, section of the, that course. So that would have been some of the places where the students went for their work days. Yeah. Um, each interdisciplinary group then collaborated to develop an idea or plan that would improve the overall health and wellness of the community. Originally, we had intended to present the ideas to the community, but that didn't happen as a part of that. We invited them to come, and so that piece kind of fell through. But it was a really exciting time when we heard the presentations from the students. And we really encouraged creativity, right, to really think outside the box. But some of the ideas that the students came up with and presented collaboratively, interdisciplinarily, uh, intergenerational hand keeping in an urban context. Um, there were some composting projects and innovations around that. Uh, another group of students created a really interesting proposal around bar bio barriers to decrease the noise pollution, uh, some greenhouse development to increase access to healthy food, uh, community cooking classes, and then this one was really interesting. interesting. A lot of the students noticed that there was produce just kind of unharvested and going to waste. So community education to promote efficiencies in collecting produce in the community gardens to maximize um, sort of that distribution and uh, that food. So again, another interesting that happened, thing that happened is that students from both uh, ecology and social work ended up going to the state capitol for an event that happened, an advocacy event. So just on their own, um, they, well, we went with them, but they were, you know, was outside of the parameters of class. And that bottom right picture is another thing during when we went to the Longfellow Garden students and the Land Bridge students kind of ended up wandering over um, just having the opportunity to go into some additional space. So those are pictures of um, that outing. Um, is that you, I think? Um, yeah, so at the end of the semester, we had a final big group meeting where the students presented their ideas um, that we were just talking about. And, um, just so I don't forget to say it later, one of my, one of the things that I think that we could have done better is in those projects if we would have actually had not only interdisciplinary student groups, but also engaged with community members. Um, because as we said earlier, it's important to recognize that they're the experts on what they need. So we didn't do that part well. Um, we also administered a post-project survey that included some of the same questions as the pre-project survey did, as well as some open-ended questions about student experiences in the project. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about our results from the survey. So the first thing that we learned, oh, and by the way, I want to just uh, acknowledge that Joel Fredrickson did our, um, our statistical analysis, which was really good. Um, and so here's what we learned, what Joel learned for us, is that first of all, there was strong internal consistency in our kind of two grouped sets of questions, the group about climate change and the group about social dominance. Um, and secondly, we learned that our students were very different in their ideas about climate change. 
However, um, and maybe this wasn't too surprising, the students in the social work class had a significantly higher average score on the social dominance scale compared to the students in my ecology class. And so this result suggested that they um, valued social equality more than um, a hierarch hierarchical structure. And so here is just the t data table that shows you this. Um, and you can see the p-values, um, not significant for climate change, and a, definitely a significant p-value for the social dominant scale. And then um, in terms of our other general questions that we asked, there were two items that were where we saw statistical differences between the two groups. The first one was the item, all Minnesota communities have equal access to healthy foods, and the social work students were significantly more likely to disagree with that statement compared to the ecology students. And the second item here, um, because I believe access to health care is a basic human right, I support universal health care, um, the social work students were significantly more likely to agree with that statement. And I think that we could say that in general, the students in the ecology class were a little bit more conservative politically than the students in the social work class. Um, all of our other items, there was no statistical difference um, at the beginning. And then sadly, we didn't think ahead well enough to make a way to identify students with each other in the beginning, the pre-survey and the post-survey. And so sadly, we didn't have a way of determining whether our project made a difference in any particular students or as a group. Um, but we did see that there weren't very, much, very many differences um, in the post compared to the pre-survey if we just looked at all the students together. And then I think you were going to say something else? Um, or maybe that's it. No, I think you yeah, didn't do quality. Yeah, and then in terms of qualitative data based on their responses to more of our open-ended questions, um, several things emerged. And the first one was that they just really appreciated the interdisciplinary collaboration. They enjoyed getting to know somebody outside of their major. The social work students talked about how important it was for them or how valuable it was for them to learn about ecology from students who are majoring in biology or environmental science. And vice versa, the environmental science students appreciated what they learned from the social work students. And in fact, um, they wished that they would have had more time, more opportunities to interact with each other. That was one of the big feedback things they gave us on how to improve. Um, they also really valued getting into the community and interacting with the community members and learning about what was going on in the community. They were all really impressed, or many of them were impressed, of, about all the community gardens that were happening in these urban settings. Um, and they suggested lots of improvements, like let us spend more time together, and like plan better. That was like a major thing. <laughs> Uh, and one of the things I, I also wanted to comment in our internal um, social work assessment data that we gather, um, so those students that participated in that in the fall of 2019 when we gathered their end of the program data, they all, many of them commented on the loving the interdisciplinary, learning from the ecology perspective, and helping them understand environmental justice and why in the world don't we do more interdisciplinary collaboration. So I, I think that it was... Sometimes you can't tell what the students are thinking about things. Right. So it's really helpful to get that, but it was very powerful for many of the students, and we didn't really expect that and to find that in our own data. So we want to just talk about a couple of the implications. Um, obviously, through this engagement discussion and community and our interdisciplinary collaboration, we had the opportunity for not just the students, but the faculty to learn about the impact of environmental injustice in an urban context, and then to explore those sustainable opportunities and ways to think about making a difference in the lives of people who have been historically marginalized. Um, 
The interdisciplinary collaboration with experts in the environmental sciences should be considered as a pedagogical strategy for developing a specific skill set to address environmental justice. So that's one part of my feedback on that, um, that national task force. It's great that we develop all these things, but unless we provide practical ways to equip students to really know how to do this work, then it really is lip service. And if we're going to put that into our competencies, then we have to do this kind of work. Otherwise, we don't know how to do this kind of um, practice. Paolo Freire expressed that social workers have to be more than moral agents and that our attempts to be neutral results in the propagation of oppressive hegemonic systems. This is true within the context of environmental justice too. If we are only giving lip service to it and not really equipping students with the skills that they need to actually practice this, then we are just um, doing exactly what he said, we're just be propagating those oppressive systems. Um, research shows that efforts to promote environmental reconciliation, such as land bridges, sustainable urban greening, and bio barriers contribute to the elimination of health disparities and at-risk communities. So again, we have to do this work. Um, and some of these quotes come from our, our writing up of this project. Such strategies contribute to an increase in urban vitality and positively impact social movements movements across multiple contexts. And it's also important to recognize the concept of like gentrification in this context. As we see like greening is kind of a thing, right? Everybody wants to be environmental justice. So all of a sudden now, it's starting to be commodified just like everything else and taken out of the grasp of um, really being able to do it in the communities where it needs it most because there, there's a cost and it's sort of like the hip thing to do. So I think we need to be aware of I know that's not a, like an academic term, the hip thing to do. But I'm just it saying works. it's being gentrified along with everything else. And along with that gentrification, there's a mismatch in terms of then how the people of the communities are served. Yeah, so one of my big takeaways from this project was just how important it is to get out in the communities to do this kind of work. Really important for, uh, in the context of my science class, I take my students on lots of field trips to see plants, um, and rarely do I take them out into communities. So this was just kind of eye-opening to me. Um, and also, just the interdisciplinarity was really valuable. And so we just want to advocate for doing more interdisciplinary work um, and more community-based work. So, I like that Amy's students go out and look at plants. I have some in my office that aren't doing very well, so if you want to come over and look at those. Sure. Yeah. Um, I can tell you why they're dying, probably. Can't think so. <laughs> um, so I think truly it resulted in a deeper understanding of the importance of this interdisciplinary collaboration. And um, most of you may know, many of you may know, that um, last year we launched an MSW program. And so this experience really got me thinking about um, what that program, that MSW program, was going to look like. And framing it, every MSW program across the country has an area of specialization. It might be aging, it might be clinical. Um, and what we have chosen to do in our program is a justice-informed MSW program that really has the heart of, at its heart, is designed to meet the needs of these very communities who suffer in multi, a multitude of ways at the hands of sort of these systemic issues. And <clears throat> although we have clinical and other pieces in there, we do have courses that are um, related to understanding like the socioeconomic injustice issues and marketplace economies that impact communities that are designed to look at environmental justice issues and health disparities, so classes specific to that, which I am super happy about. Hopefully students will want to come. Actually, we will have 16 graduate in our first class, so that's exciting. Ooh, awesome. Um, so the content in the newly launched MSW program does include courses specifically to adjust that. And the Justice Informed Competencies, we developed nine of those. Um, and the curriculum encouraged students to explore why some groups of people are disproportionately harmed by systemic oppression and injustice. Um, justice Informed Social Workers should possess and continue to develop specialized knowledge and understanding, including relevant issues related to advancing environmental justice. So again, this is kind of saying the same thing. It was powerful. I think it was transformative to our students and transformative um, for us. And we know that um, to decrease health disparities that this work has to be done. 
So next steps, I don't have no idea where, I think we're doing well on time. Um, the first one is that um, Amy and I have uh, written a chapter, a case study, and it's um, the manuscript is now with the people who look at it. Um, but it's an eco-social work practice book that will be published in the NASW Press, I think, next year in the fall. Um, and, and we're looking at collaborating again this fall. I'll be teaching a class called Environment and Humanity, which is just a perfect kind of class to in include an environmental justice um, unit. It's a 100 level class, so it'll be really different, but um, we're brainstorming about that. And I'm looking at other like faculty here and thinking about what other kinds of interdisciplinary collaborations, um, maybe to help people better understand some of those political or historical things or crisis related things can we create to really think differently at Bethel about how we engage our students from a holistic perspective and an interdisciplinary perspective. So um, that that's kind of where we are. So I know we have a couple minutes. We want to thank you for your, t oh, a couple last pictures again. Uh, Kuge was recently featured in our, um, uh, on the Bethel page. Um, nice. And she's one of our beautiful, uh, Karen students who really engaged in this work, and uh, so I just wanted to include that. We want to thank Tan and Brecky for helping us envision and plan this work, and again, Joel um, for his invaluable assistance, and Melvin, who it works very closely with us. And I know Min Young knows that because she taught this class last year, and some of those events were in there. It wasn't interdisciplinary, but are there any questions, or would you like me to go back to that picture? I that think I showed you at the beginning. Okay. <laughs> so, because it's so, yeah. Okay, would you like to ask us anything? <laughs> so, thanks. First, thank you so much for coming. I know that you have many competing interests, so we're happy to have you here. But are, is there anything that we can, anything else we can share or any questions? Andy. Question about the um, political tensions this might have raised. So, you highlighted, for example, that. It sounds like your students, Amy, on average, were a little more on the conservative side. Um, as somebody who teaches in political science, I can certainly imagine this kind of being a, something where you also you get students pushing back, not because they necessarily substantively disagree, but because you're crossing a, a line in terms of what they think of as their political category. So did you get any, any pushback like that? If so, how did you handle that? I'm just kind of curious what that looked like. So I would say that um, First of all, remember that this had happened in the fall of 2019, so it was before the pandemic, it was before George Floyd's um, death. And so I think, I think we were less polarized at the time. Um, and also, it's been a long time, and so I can't really remember. So um, I don't remember strong pushback from my students. Uh, but I just remember seeing the results on the survey and realizing that there were some disparities between our students. And I think, Andy, we didn't really create a space to talk about that. You know, where there were limited, you know, connections with the students, but I certainly think that had we, that would have come up for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Samuel. Yes, my question is based on the literature of interdisciplinary studies. Based on the literature, not every scholar can engage in interdisciplinary studies. There are personality characteristics. Sometimes there are training orientation. Some scholars have training capacity, which means by the very nature of their training, it makes it very difficult for them to collaborate with somebody. So what are some personality characteristics that you think made this possible? Well, first of all, <laughs> we come together in a really nice blended photo. We do. Um, uh, I don't know, I think part of it is we like each other, and I don't remember, I think we met on a task force that was unrelated to either of our fields, and I think we enjoyed <laughs> working together, and I think that was part of it, and I really admire Edie, and she's always outdoors doing things, and so I think Edie has an environmental awareness that I was, that I was aware of, and I don't know if I have, I don't know. 
I just like Amy. <laughs> well, and I like Amy, and I think that's key, right? Like, we are able to get along very well. And I think also, it, we we do complement each other, too. Like, Amy today was like, I'm going to put these notes. You look very nice today. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, we do that, too. Um, but I think that those are their strengths that she has, and even in the writing of our book chapter, um, you know, and we're patient with one another. Don't judge awesome. each other. So Samuel, yeah, I, I agree that there are definitely challenges around that, and luckily we worked well together, and that's why we we're wanting to move forward. Kathy. Uh, I will answer that question in two ways. One is to say these are, are two women who uh, listen to each other, to other people, to what's going on in the world. I would say you are both deep listeners. So that's a characteristic. And, and secondly, I would say that you also have a way of identifying what the common interests are that, and you keep that as your kind of light in the, in the darkness, so to speak, that you work toward and you're willing to fumble toward that um, and, and to rest in that journey together. That's what I do. Thanks. I would say that there was quite a bit of fumbling. <laughs> <laughs> I chose that word especially. <laughs> and our students did point that out, right? <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. So, Thanks for your questions, Andrew. Yeah. Anything else before we wrap up? Kent. Um, at the risk of not calling out too many people, but I think from your collaboration, are there other groups, programs, people that came to mind that I pulled that you thought, like, boy, I wish we could pull them in, or I, I, I wonder what they would think about this, or, yeah. yeah. What occurred to you? I'm going to say yes, because I, I have way too many ideas. And so I already had contacted... So uh, to me, there's theological implications around this. So last summer, I met with Amy Papaga and Eric Leifblad um, to talk about some ideas. Um, you know, I have previous to this even talked with somebody in um, political science about like, could we do a case scenario um, where students from, it's an interdisciplinary event. So, but I have also had to, because I have new programs starting and because I, I think about too many things, I've had to say, okay, we're going to focus on this because it's a good project, and we're launching some other things. So right now, I am thinking about things, but not. I'm trying to keep my mouth shut and not talk to too many people about my ideas, truthfully. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to add one piece in answer to Samuel's question about collaboration. Another key factor is that Edie really loves to collaborate. So. I do love to yes. collaborate. But so she's always got ideas about who she can draw in to help um, flush out some of her ideas. And one is our collaboration with the Spark, with, with Kent um, and Corey, is that we are in the process of pulling together and working on the launch of the Spark Journal for Justice Informed Social Work Practice and Research. Um, so that's another sort of collaboration that we're doing, but I'm trying to stay focused on doing these things well instead of 100 things not well, So which I, I, I idea. sometimes do. Yeah. So, but yes, thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Well, we really appreciate you coming. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming. If anybody wants us to.